professing statements of any kind. Breakfast they can science on tap, these are two things you can really do. So it's all about the conversation. It's all about getting people talking in your community. That's Amish country, by the way, outside of, of uh, down south of Worcester. Um, so here's the one. Remember I talked about no jargon. So take a second to, to, to look at this. The first sentence. Under pristine encoding conditions, research suggests there's a strong relationship between confidence and accuracy and eyewitness memory. Uh, this was sent out with the Science on Tap list as the way to encourage the public to come to this talk. <laughs> I'm a really smart guy. I read that first sentence and I walked away. <laughs> and I came back and read everything two more times before I finally really was starting to get what they're saying. This is not enticing. This will work to a group of scientists, but it's not going to work for the average public. So think about the language you're doing, whether you're reaching out to journalists or you're reaching out to the community. Think about how you communicate. Now, one thing that I, I, I didn't talk about yet that I think is really critically important. Uh, this is my own personal belief, and some of you will hate me for it, but I hope you'll at least take this in. We're in a very difficult time. With climate change, biodiversity loss, all the things that are happening right now, it's a very difficult time for humanity. Well, not for the world, the world will kick us out and the world will go on merrily in its own way, but for us, it's a pretty bad time. And we don't have a huge time frame anymore to change that. Uh, so, in my mind, anybody who has specific knowledge that can help, not only has a right, but has a responsibility to use that knowledge in a way to communicate with people to try and affect change. It's going to be frustrating, it's going to make you mad, but it's something that I believe that all of you have a responsibility to do. So you can hate me for it, but think about it, because I think it's really important. You understand these things. I listened to the talks this morning, some amazing science going on out there, and in your community there's probably five people who know about it and understand its implications. You have a responsibility in whatever way you can, talking to the media, talking to the community, organizing these, these events where people can come and, and have this conversation. You have a responsibility, I believe, to make that happen. So you can make a difference. This is the thing I want you to take away with. All the examples I gave, though, those were huge insults, but they can happen on a smaller scale. It doesn't have to be a crisis that makes things happen. We're already in crisis mode. It's bad enough as it is. Just having those conversations, getting those stories on the air, getting people to think differently can make a huge difference. And you always need to have some level of hope. Engage the media, educate your friends, talk with your neighbors, most importantly, science the shit. Thank you. If you didn't hear the question, it's whether universities could do more to prepare students going out into the world to communicate. And that's a really important question. I, I, I say absolutely yes. There are a lot of efforts. I was just talking to Tony about the Alan Alda Institute and the work that they do down at Stony Brook. There are other things like this, the uh, Alda Leopold Institute, I believe, just the science training. But there's not enough. And it's important for a number of reasons. NSF is including in its grants a require, more requirements for public engagement and public communication as a part of it. So if you don't know how to do that, you're kind of in trouble. So I think universities are culpable in this, and they're not doing enough. Every university, every science student in the university should, at a minimum, take at least one course that teaches them some of the techniques, and at least have a conversation like this. And I would love to see universities actually engage. That, that, that blurb, by the way, about the, the Science on Tap was written by Skidmore, uh, which is their communication people, who should know better. Uh, but at a minimum, they should be having the students get engaged on that level. They're not doing it, but I would gladly come to any university and talk about this and beat them up because it's that important. Yes, please. If memory serves me correct, it was always very good that the more people are educated, the better informed they are to make the right decision. Since the 60s, we've been pushing the big idea of more people need to get into college, more people need to do this and that. But that poll that you showed right there, even though you educate them to the high school level and beyond, 
you're still getting the, the kickbacks of, uh, of religion and other things showing up in decision making. The, the, the denial thing, there is no such thing as evolution or if it is there and so on. How do we overcome that? In, in other words, we put all this money into education, it's all spent it out there, and it somehow comes up short. Well, honestly, we don't put that much money into education. Uh, compared well, to other countries, we're not doing nearly enough. And the, the education system, there's a technical term for this, it, it often sucks. It's, it's very scientific, I'm sorry. But, but look, my, my kids went to Saratoga. We, my kids were born in Washington, D.C., and I didn't want to raise them there because I think it's kind of a weird place, especially for kids. <laughs> uh, and so we moved to Saratoga, and they went to school there. Highly rated, one of the top school districts in the country. They failed my kids miserably. It's teaching to the test, it's memorization. My daughter, who is at Suny Oneonta, whoever the, they saw someone from Oneonta earlier, a great school, but she has a processing issue. She can't memorize, is, is the practical effect of that. And our schooling is based on memorization. She had a 90 average, 92 average in high school because she worked so hard at it. But the school system failed her. I had a Fulbright back in 2010, so my kids went to an international baccalaureate program for a year. My daughter is in fifth grade. She was ahead of her class when she came back by three years because it's experiential, it's hands-on. The learning method was very different. So anyway, yes, we have more people who have graduated from high school, still not enough from college, but the education system has failed. How many science classes does the average person have to take in high school? How many do they have to take in college unless you're going to be a science major? Not a lot. And then when you add in all the tribalism, and that's, this is the big issue. So you raised it, and I, I don't, I, I can go on this for years, but I'm not going to try and keep it short. But there's a lot of research on this. I grew up in an industry that said, just what you did, our role is to put out information, the public takes it in, it informs them, and they make better decisions. But all the research now says that that's bullshit. Sorry, it's another technical term. <laughs> but it's absolute bullshit. And the reason is because of tribalism. So, Tribal beliefs, it turns out, are much stronger than facts. So there's a guy at Yale named Dan Kahan. Anybody who's interested, I can send you some of his papers or just search him, K-A-H-A-N. Uh, he he's done amazing work on this. And what they find, of course, is that people affiliated by tribes, when scientific information, or any information for that matter, challenges that tribal belief, they will tend to discount. And the smarter they are, this is the really interesting aspect, the smarter they are, they don't learn from that. The smarter they are, the better they can find those outlying studies that support those bullshit beliefs. So there's a lot of work that goes into this. Now he found something really interesting, which was a cohort he called the scientifically curious. And these are people who will take information and change. So I'm trying to figure out what this means for journalists because our world has been rocked by this. How do we reach people who wouldn't normally listen to us with important information? And can those scientific and curious people become influencers who can move within these groups and change? There's a, a not enough conversation in journalism about this, but I think it's a really, really critical issue for us. But if you do things like go out to church groups, this is where some of that tribalism exists. And if you can get those tribes to take in this information and have a, a non-threatening conversation, this is why I think this is really sneaky and a great way of starting to affect change. If you can get those groups, which, especially in conservative churches, are much less likely to believe some of the science information, if you can begin to crack that wall and get information in that sense and start changing, I think that can make a difference. There you go. You're off your hunger. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is rough from last night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for making it today. <laughs> in terms of telling a story, working with a journalist, how do you work? How do you avoid telling a crisis story, or what, what's more effective, a good story, a crisis story, um, something that is important? You know, how do you how do you get messages across to people that you know find that it matters? A good story, a bad story. It seems like crises. People listen to me. They do, and it gets them depressed. I mean, the problem is, how do you also, you, you need to cover those things, you need to talk about it. For God's sakes, we need people to better understand climate change and the effects it's having right now. What Tony was talking about, water levels, what some of the, what, what the scientists, was the trout or whatever, I mean, the, the evidence is mounting. It's becoming greater and greater, and that is kind of a crisis mode. So you're right, how do you balance? How do you, how do you get the severity of this across to people? 
without scaring the crap out of it. And that's, that's, that's a huge balance. Now this, this is mediated by another factor. Uh, a guy named Andy Refkin, uh, who was at the New York Times for years, used to say, and I, I, I find this to be very true, the path to being an editor of a newspaper or a boss of a TV or radio station or network doesn't go through the science test. It goes through the politics test. So coverage is reflected in that lens. You know, how many are really pissed off with the coverage of the primaries and elections right now? Anybody? It's all the horse race. Who's up? Who's down? Uh, I forget the paper. I think it was in North Carolina, maybe the Charlotte Observer, that in 1990, 90, 91, somewhere back there, they did, they, they did their, environment, or their, their uh, political coverage vastly differently. They did a survey, many surveys of the community. What are the top 10 issues that are most important to you? Their political coverage reflected that. Everything was based around those issues. Not who's, who's highest in the polls, not who's down, not who doesn't have enough people on the ground in Iowa, for God's <laughs> sakes, but about these important issues. It was a huge success in that community. No one's done it again. <laughs> and in part because I think the worldview of those who are leaders, it just doesn't exist today. I mean, I love NPR. I absolutely love NPR, but every time Mar Lyson starts talking, I want to throw up because all the stories are about the horse race. And they, every four years, there's a big chest beating and mea culpas and, oh, we blew the coverage and, and we'll do better next time. And four years later, it's like a crap. They can't help themselves. I, I was in uh, uh, South Sudan in 2015 and 16. And I was in the middle of a village nowhere. I was working with journalists there. No TV, no radio, no internet. I mean, I was for nine months, I was completely isolated. And the primary started in 2016. I came back to Jew with the capital and I had, I had air conditioning, which was exciting. I had hot water for the shower that wasn't you know, full of bacteria from the tank we used in the Tourle where I live. And I had cable TV. So I, I remember this very clearly. I'm standing in the shower, just happy. And I've got CNN on. And Trump had just had a rally in Texas. And they took, every instance of when he said lying Ted in that speech and strung them together and played lying Ted, lying Ted, lying Ted, lying Ted. It was like 15, 20 seconds long. And then they laughed about it. Well, all the research, go old, you know, you keep repeating a lie often enough it becomes true. But they won't accept that culpability. They don't understand the role they played in this stuff. Sorry, you really touched me. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm going to be driving home like this. Um, but, but it's important that we talk to the media about those things too. So, Look, I'm, I'm one of the biggest critics of my industry. Uh, I think that we do things really, really badly. We need to get away from just crisis reporting. Crisis reporting is important, but that's the news. This just happened. This is what's going on. But then you have to have those contextual pieces later on that really help explain that. And this is where you guys can help. Some crisis happens in your community, and you have knowledge about what the effects are. Go to these reporters that you've already developed a relationship with, or the editors, and just say, look, Here's a story you might be interested in because it didn't affect what's just happened here. So you can you can help affect change in that. I, I really deep down in my heart believe this, or else I just you know become a corporate shill or something. I think it's important to be doing these things and having these conversations so we can affect that coverage and make it more than just what's the latest crisis. John Stewart after uh, Katrina had this great bit where he was talking about. Uh, the media coverage, and the media is like uh, eight-year-olds playing soccer, and so they're all over here because the ball, the ball pops out, boom, boom, ball, and all over running over there. But you can see that in the coverage, you know, it's like this ADD or a squirrel sort of coverage, and and with this administration, it happens even more because there's so many squirrels out there that they're pinballing from one to another. You just can't keep it in your head. We need to find a way to help them be more focused. So that's the national media. The local media is much different. And I think that there's much more opportunity to engage with the local media on these issues. But uh, you know, it's it's not the battle because there are systemic issues with the media that lead to this sort of stuff. Boy, that just left it such a downer. <laughs> <laughs> so you jokingly mentioned that you know, journalists don't get paid much anymore, and kind of along what you're just talking about. Newspapers are going out of business. People don't read newspapers. The number of journalists is going down. Given all that, what, what should be our marching orders or approach to try to deal with that situation? Yeah, you know, we're, we're in a, uh, a massive time of disruption. Um, we have a paradigm shift. You know, it happened with Gutenberg and the printing press. And for 50 years, the monks who held that information really tight and the, you know, all this sort of stuff, it was just, it was chaos. They didn't know what to do. Technology has put, it in that, put us in that position now, so there's a lot of chaos out there. 
and it's very disruptive and it's very disturbing. You know, I have a lot of friends who can't find work. I mean, it's it's really troubling what the situation is out there. Forget the figures, but something like one third of the journalists in the country since 2005 have been laid off. Something ridiculous like that. The papers that are closing. Um, I ran an online newspaper in Saratoga for two years called Saratoga Wire because I was so mad at our local paper, which wasn't doing any sort of coverage. And did it for two years, worked 20 hour days, and we folded it, and I made not one cent. I was proud that we did not have any debt when we folded it, but we made no money whatsoever. Um, so it, it is difficult out there. So support those journalists that, that you uh, uh, know are doing a good job. It's even more important to encourage them now. Um, I, if I had a tote bag, I'd hold it up and say, contribute to your public media nearby. Um, but there are a lot of things you can do just to try and try and change that. But it's, you're right, it's harder to find local outlets in your community. So who's covering it? What TV station is covering bringing cameras into your community? Um, there's got to be, hopefully, some reporter out there who's at least doing something in your area that you can talk to. And frankly, whenever I travel, I try to go in and just meet editors. Just to say hi, talk about resilience, where, which is where my head is, which to me is higher than adaptation. Because adaptation, sustainability, all those are elements of resilience. Resilience is sort of like the big nut. Uh, uh, and I, I, I talk to them about that just to try and get them to understand the need for this kind of coverage. Uh, and it's been somewhat effective. They, they don't throw me out at least. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of the issue for some of you in communities that are underserved or not served by media outlets. What do you do? And that's where I think the community outreach begins. And that's where you go and talk to churches. And this is where you get these groups going. Um, I think that's, there's still things you can do because you have this knowledge and it's important to do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I was inspired by all those hands raised up at the end there. Um, okay, just to let you know, we have uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, I forgot to state a very important name earlier at the beginning of this plenary, and that is Scott Schluter, who is our Secretary Treasurer, who is also on the Executive Committee. Um, you, many of you know him, so you know he's here. Uh,